computer vision, learning, and autonomous robotics, which includes drones, self-driving, or flying cars, and many more things. And his main lifetime ambition was to promote both the exploration of space and improvements of sustainable living on Earth. And going to know about him more, we'll be going to know about his details about his uh, where he studied and everything so he received his ms degree in artificial intelligence and robotics from school of computer science carnegie mellon university usa in 2016 and his bs degree in electronics and communication engineering in 2013 currently he is working as a research analyst scientist at nasa jet propulsion laboratory in california and he, as well as he's working on artificial intelligence technologies for robotic exploration of earth mars and beyond sounds interesting right so we'll be just continuing with the session sir welcome sir once again thank you uh, i would request again all of you who's just joined to please uh, kindly mute your microphones for for the sake of everyone Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, again, for inviting me for this webinar. I'm really excited to uh, speak to all of you and share some of the things I find interesting. Uh, I'll be mostly talking about some of the work I do at the intersection of computer vision, machine learning, and space exploration. Uh, before I begin my talk, I'd like to just uh, say that I hope all of you are doing, uh, staying safe, uh, are healthy in these really difficult times. And uh, I know it's. I'm assuming most of you, uh, most of you are dialing in from India. So given it's Saturday night, uh, dinner time, I'm really glad that a lot of uh, so many of you have skipped your Saturday evening plans to hear what I have to say. This is really uh, a great feeling, and thank you so much again for coming. At any point, if you guys feel it's getting too boring for you, please feel free to stop me, and we can move to question answers at that point. Uh, Otherwise, let's hold some of the questions till the end uh, because it's a pretty big crowd, so it would be hard to get interactive and get through the presentation otherwise. Uh, okay, let's get started. So uh, the agenda or the theme of the talk, I'm going to give a very high level overview of, the, of some of the topics that's listed here. That's computer vision, machine learning, and space exploration. Assuming that you guys are all from uh, very diverse backgrounds, I'm going to briefly introduce these topics and then discuss how I have been using this in my work and how uh, I help NASA use some of these things for the future of space exploration. Before I get to this, uh, I'd like to start by telling uh, all of you guys a bit about myself. Uh, so my journey, uh, especially because a lot of you are students, so I'm hoping some of you would be interested in learning about my journey and might have questions regarding how to follow uh, or get some guidelines regarding how to do that. So I'm from India originally. I was born and brought up in Kolkata. I did my undergrad, as Shreya already mentioned, and give you a brief on this. I did my undergrad in electrical and communication engineering from Manipal University in Karnataka. After that, I had a few stints at different places uh, mostly in Europe, where I spent a couple of years doing research uh, and working at university labs, getting more experience and internships before uh, pursuing my master's degree at Carnegie Mellon University in robotics and AI. After I graduated from there, I basically I joined uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, which is in Los Angeles, California, and I've been working there since then for four, almost four years now. Uh, I'm very happy to discuss uh, my journey through question answer, and this is a very interactive thing at the end. So uh, if you guys have any question about your own careers, about anything or how to pursue or questions about my career, uh, please feel free to ask me about that towards the end. So let's start with uh, defining what really is this hype about AI. Uh, as, uh, we d as was mentioned before, uh, this is one of the really upcoming fields of artificial uh, AI. Is usually it's AI is the buzzword, but it stands for artificial intelligence. It's almost coined now by some of the people as the new electricity, and that's a pretty big thing to say. But at the same time, there has been a lot of uh, growth, and it's impacting so many industries, just like electricity did uh, a few a couple of centuries back. And it's almost pervasive enough to all uh, the different industries and making a huge impact across businesses. Uh, throughout the world. So, but what is this thing called AI? 
how I like to define it is it's basically any computer system that can sense the environment, think, learn, and act in response to what they see, just like a human brain does in response to senses like our eyes. Um, that is that that in itself is AI. This topic and my work uh, is focused a lot more on computer vision. So what is actually computer vision? Or uh, sometimes you would hear this as machine vision. Uh, how I like to uh, define this is this very nice definition from David Marr, who is one of the founding fathers of computer vision, who defines this in very simple terms as answering two, uh, asking two basic questions. What what is present in the world and where it is. These two questions of what and where really define uh, about computer vision. And if you think about how humans use their eyes, this is very similar and modeled around the same way in terms of how humans want to, uh, how we constantly scan around our world and we look for things, what is present and where it is. And this is really make, making computers do that and machines do that on, the, uh, on their own and reason and act according to that is the goal of computer vision at, at a, uh, as a whole. Uh, let me start um, by asking, asking you guys this question of, uh, when you see this picture, and if I ask you, what is, uh, what is that? Can you describe me that sofa? Or what do you see when you see that sofa? How would you describe it? Uh, so some of you would probably say that it is, something you might get very quantitative about it. Um, can you guys still screen my screen and hear my audio? Yes, yes. yes. Oh. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. Sorry for the delay again. So as I was saying, uh, this is, uh, did you guys hear anything I said about this slide or should I repeat this? Yeah, you can repeat. Okay, uh, I'll quickly go over this again. So what I was saying is when you look at an image, a human can define typically these, uh, anything that he sees in multiple ways. Uh, one of it, it could either be quantitative like the first answer or it could be qualitative like the second answer. Uh, is one of them correct? Not necessarily. And often the goal of computer vision is to answer both of these questions, sometimes quantitative, which we often refer to as measurement and sometimes semantics. Uh, in the world, when you see computer vision or AI applications, you would see one of these two things. One of the ways would be when sometimes we use computer vision for measurement. So consider example of a Mars rover moving on uh, on the surface of Mars or a self-driving car which is navigating the streets of California. Some of the things it would need to do typically is look how far particular objects are. So for example, for the image on the right, it has these black boxes and it needs to see where these uh, how far those pedestrians are or how far those cars are. And that's where the computer vision, we are trying to answer the question of uh, of how far or measure things in terms of how far things are. Or uh, yes, that's, that's when we use computer vision for measurement. When we talk about using computer vision for qualitative or semantics, we typically try to answer other tasks in computer vision that you see here. Like for example, if you're looking at that image that I showed you before, uh, what is that you're looking at the image is called as classification. Uh, once you know where what that image is, can you locate where in that image is a sofa? So that would be object detection. Other things like, for example, segmentation would be, is it a table or is it a couch? Uh, you would often not just want to do this in a qualitative understanding, but also have some physical three-dimensional understanding of of the surface. So for example, can you sit on that surface? Can you not sit on that surface? And those are usually uh, the bottom two when you try to measure or see this thing in a 3D fashion. That's uh, that's what we really call as semantics. And these are very broadly speaking, two of the very, uh, two areas of computer vision that are used. Now, why is, so we've been developing computer vision methods for several decades now, almost six to seven decades since the early 50s. But computer vision as we know it is very hard. And one of the reasons for that is because humans do it so easily. If you think of your brain, your brain is a fantastic processor for computer vision. But the, co the counter side of that is we just don't understand, our, understand ourselves how well or how do we do that? If, if, you, if I have to ask you that, if, uh, for example, how do you navigate, how do you move up, go out of the room? Can you really write a mathematical equation to do that? No, it's very hard to do that. And that's something neuroscientists have still not understood. 
And since we don't understand this, it's really hard to even model something or de develop an algorithm to do that. Uh, let's take an example here of if you if I ask you which of the two red lines in the picture is bigger, most of you would say the one on the right, which is the bigger wall. But it turns out that for the picture, it's actually the same size. Both of them have the same dimensions and the same same uh, same height. And this is a, a classic illusion. And this happens a lot uh, when we, even with our own eyes. And this is mostly because when we take an image, we are almost reducing a dimensionality of that. The second problem that we often face is uh, what I described as uh, we, we ourselves don't have a good understanding of what uh, how to define certain things. So for example, there are so many varieties of a chair. If I tell you that, can you define me? How do you, uh, what is that you call the chair? How would you really draw a picture of the chair? Would, which one of these three would it be? And uh, is one of them wrong? Not necessarily. So this is what makes developing algorithms for computer vision very hard. But this is where in the last uh, one or two decades, we've had a lot of uh, great development in this field of machine learning. And I'll very briefly talk about what machine learning is uh, in, a, in a moment, but in a very simple way, machine learning just refers to the science that tries to learn meaningful statistics from data. And this is very similar to how humans do it. We don't necessarily have physical models, like for example, Newton's law of physics. We don't have a law of physics for how we define a cow, but since birth, we have seen a lot of examples of cow, and now we know how to recognize a cow, even though there is a lot of variation in how cows look like. Uh, and this is the same way how our human brain learns. And this is the field of machine learning, and we try to teach machines through data how to learn and recognize and uh, perceive things. The, this field is, uh, machine learning is not really new, and computer vision and machine learning is uh, there's a, the umbrella field for that is what's called artificial intelligence. And it's been there since the early 1950s. And there's, in the early, uh, since the early few decades, the most of the development was through development of very specific algorithms that, that we know how to model. So if we know how to do things, for example, if we know how to, if you're given two numbers, can we make the computer create a sum of that numbers or calculate a particular thing? We typically know how to write down the rules for that. So it's easy for us to write down codes for it. Uh, what we've seen in the last, uh, a great amount of development in the last couple of decades is this field of machine learning and a subfield of deep learning where we have started to use, as I mentioned, data rather than knowing how to do things if we basically just throw data at it and let the machine tell us what to do. Uh, this is this is just a picture, uh, for example, this is just what I was trying to describe before in terms of uh, how we traditionally used to write big pieces of code to do everything. But how do we do this, for example, if we have to write, uh, if you have to play chess? If you, uh, this is a very classic example from the late 90s where we had a computer playing against the world's best chess player. But at that time, it was really hard initially, before this, it was considered very hard for humans to, uh, teach machines how to play chess because uh, the number of uh, the number of moves that you can play uh, do while playing chess is exponentially high and it's impossible to write down a piece of code that that can play chess but it turns out that just like humans learn how to play chess you can show a piece of uh, you can show the machine hundreds of examples of humans playing chess and it will learn on its own that what are the right moves and it was able to learn it so well that it could beat the world's best chess player at that time. Uh, this is a pictorial example of just the two different methods or two paradigms and what the main shift has been. Uh, as I said, before we used to have data and we, knew, we used to have these programs or rules on how to do, write algorithms. And what the, pro, what the machine would do is create output. And that was the traditional or classical way of doing artificial intelligence, computer vision, and some of the other methods. And what we have now is we don't throw in program, what we rather throw in data and what it gives out is actually the program. Uh, so this is the main fundamental difference. And it turns out this is a very powerful, powerful uh, idea. And this has really led to an exponential growth in helping us solve all the problems in computer vision and a lot of different fields of AI that were considered very hard. And because of that, a lot of development has happened in, in almost in your everyday life, you can see a lot of things where computer vision is very actively used. Uh, starting with medical imaging, a lot of uh, analysis today include
Hello, sir. Uh, can you please unmute yourself so that like someone has muted you? Uh, can you hear me again? Yes, yes, you can just continue. Okay. Can you uh, see my screen uh, again? Can you disable the authority to mute him so that nobody can do that again? Yes, yes, uh, we will do that. Actually, that feature is not in here. Okay, yeah, so. yeah, you can just uh, continue the presentation. You can see the screen. Okay, great. Um, so I was saying uh, a lot of what we see in our everyday life from your phone to your computers, uh, everything basically uses computer vision. Whenever you click a picture and use, you see facial recognition, that's basically running computer vision algorithms that have been developed on your iPhone. Uh, a lot of surveillance activity uses computer vision, self-driving cars, even, uh, and it has developed and matured so much that even rovers on the Mars, which I will talk about today, use uh, computer vision and it's been deployed and being used actively as we talk. My journey into computer vision started uh, during my undergraduate uh, during my undergraduate program where i started to get into robotics i started started off developing small robots like line followers like a lot of you might have experience with but eventually i started uh, gain very curiosity into what kinds of places how to make these robots even more intelligent and one of the first things i realized was in order to make robots intelligent you need to teach them how to see and in the pursuit of trying to solve or help uh, learn more about computer vision and how to make robots see. I started to get deep expertise into how to do different parts of computer vision. I did a lot of internships at uh, different places in the world. I, st I played around with, I helped develop ground robots, aerial robots, uh, space robots, and uh, I got a lot of experience with developing computer vision or perception systems for uh, different kinds of robots. Here is, uh, this is just a portfolio of some of the different projects I worked on. On the, the, the left two videos, they basically showed two couple of projects where I used uh, computer vision on drones and uh, helping drones construct buildings, helping, uh, this is the kind of thing that you would typically use for making your urban maps or street view maps or helping in real, real estate or construction projects. The one on the left, uh, you see again, creating large scale city level constructions uh, using a drone and imagery and remote sensing. Similarly, I helped develop some of the other a perception system for ground robots as well as underground robots that you see on on the right and through a lot of different experiences working on developing computer vision uh, for space uh, computer vision and different parts of ai for robotics uh, i i really found this love for developing intelligent machines this combined with my childhood dream and one of the passions i had since growing up was towards space exploration i was very excited about space exploration, the future of space exploration, and how uh, I can contribute towards that. And when I started to think about during my graduate school, when I started to think about where do I want to really apply a lot of my technical skills, what kind of career I want to pursue, uh, I was very fortunate to find a role at NASA, which is probably the only place in the world which I could help uh, explore two of my most uh, biggest passions or interests. One was towards AI and robotics, and the other was towards space exploration. And it turns out that these were two fields which were very emerging. These were really hot fields in the, in the area. And I saw this as a, a very good opportunity to help disrupt not just one of the hot fields, but two of the most hot fields of the century, I feel, and contribute towards how can we use each other to uh, promote the future of space exploration and technology in general. So um, let me start by even giving a big background about what I do at, or what NASA does and why is it even important for NASA. Uh, so NASA, as you know, has, as you might know, uh, has been is really responsible for space exploration and it was formed in the early, in the late 50s, but Jet Propulsion Lab where I work, which is one of the centers of NASA was formed even a couple of decades before NASA was officially established. And for the last seven to eight decades, what we've been developing is spacecrafts, spacecrafts to explore different robotic spacecrafts to explore different parts of the solar system. And over the last few decades, we've really built uh, these we've built spacecraft that have been to different target bodies, starting from the moon and Mars to uh, the farthest parts of our solar system and even beyond this. The two spacecrafts that you see on the picture, if you can see on the picture uh, here, 
are the two Voyager spacecrafts, which are basically now exploring not just our solar system, but beyond our solar system. They are the only man-made objects today to be outside our solar system, and they are still functioning even after 40 years of launch. Uh, so we have we've, the, the, the takeaway message is that NASA has been doing pretty well, even without AI or without uh, what I, uh, without any kind of intelligent robotics. But one of the main challenges with that has been that every time we've done, uh, we've, we've sent robots or we've sent humans to the moon, we've had intelligent brains behind it. So for example, on the left, this is a picture from the humans landing on the moon from the Apollo missions. Uh, this was really made possible by the fact that we had a human behind uh, on the pilot seat that was able to navigate that spacecraft safely to the surface of the moon and back from there. In 2012, this is the picture of Curiosity on the right, the Curiosity rover, uh, also known as the Mars Science Lab, which is right now uh, run, which is right now driving on the surface of Mars, collect, doing uh, science for us and collecting samples. It's it was landed on 2012 on the surface of Mars, uh, and since then it has helped us answer so many science questions about our existence, about the solar system, and the history of the planet Mars. But there is an entire team of uh, operators that sit at, the, uh, at, at where I work, at the Jet Propulsion Lab, which helps them navigate uh, different, which helps the rover do everything. We, we communicate to the rover twice in a day, uh, a Martian day, which is called a SOL. And every time we, we basically send their detailed instructions on what to do and how to do that. But this is not a scalable solution, especially for the future, as we start to now see things uh, exploring and exponentially growing. As we have, as we start to go and explore further and further out, uh, we cannot really communicate a joystick or rover, uh, a robotic spacecraft. So consider uh, the time difference it takes to even send a signal and get it back. While for the moon, it's only a few seconds, so you can easily communicate on a real-time basis to something on the moon. It becomes harder on while it is on Mars. It's to a, it's to a matter of few minutes. Now, as we start exploring further away objects, for example. Europa, which is one of the moons of uh, moons of Saturn. And it is one of the most interesting places in the solar system because we believe there is evidence of life uh, uh, on Europa. So it's really a hot target body and NASA is trying to send a robotic spacecraft to go to Europa and detect life, which will be a huge discovery uh, for humanity in general. But imagine a spacecraft on, on the surface of Europa. It takes one hour to even send a signal there and one hour to get it back. That's also depending on where Europa is with respect to Earth. So if we want to operate a spacecraft, it is almost impossible to actually send signals and operate it on a real-time basis. It needs to have the autonomy so that it can act intelligently and behave on its own. This is the same thing even close to Earth when we are just based on scale and the economy of exponential growth. On the left, you see a picture of uh, Earth with all the satellites that are in orbit right now. So as you see, the number of spacecrafts uh, and objects in space is growing exponentially, and it's only going to keep growing with all the commercial space uh, commercial space about to explode. So with that, it's almost impossible to also communicate and operate spacecraft in, uh, by humans here on Earth. What we need is these spacecraft to be fairly decentralized and operate on its own and, and talk to humans only when they need to and when there is an emergency situation. Similarly, when we scale to colonies on Mars, like Elon Musk would, uh, Elon Musk would like to build, then we would again, we cannot really operate uh, in the in the current paradigm that we have been using. So this is where a lot of AI technologies like computer vision and machine learning comes into play. And as we start to explore the next few decades of space exploration, it's the key enabler, and it will allow us to grow exponentially and really open a space age. And that's um, and my role here at NASA is to help develop some of those computer vision technologies and machine learning technologies for enabling space exploration. In my view, I have summarized here in in a few pictures and, and descriptions what are some key areas that I believe computer vision can be used. This is in no way comprehensive, but uh, in the next ten minutes, I'll try to give you some examples of what are. Uh, some examples of how I have been uh, contributing towards using computer vision and how some of the colleagues I work with have been using computer vision for doing for solving uh, robotic exploration problems. Uh, so one of the first areas that uh, 
one of the first very obvious areas that we can use AI uh, is for Mars rovers and autonomous navigation. Think of this as self-driving cars on, on Mars. And to think of it, we've already been doing self-driving cars on Mars for a bit. It's just been uh, semi-autonomous. We've had rovers, we've had human operators that have planned missions for it, and it's been going sending instructions and doing that in a semi-autonomous fashion. But as we start to scale, we want these rovers to be operating on a very large scale of several days without even any human intervention and just uh, operate and travel long distances on its own. So one of the, uh, some of the key technologies that it will be requiring are similar to what we use here on Earth. On the right, you see an example of uh, a hazard avoidance system that uses computer vision. This was one of the first computer vision technologies that was built and deployed outside planet Earth. And this was already in the late 90s or early 2000s when we had a Mars rover that was using some form of computer vision on the surface of Mars. Uh, it's what it's doing is it's basically creating a tree. It's taking images as it moves. It's creating a 3D environment and it's finding where are hazards. In this case, as you see in the picture, a rock. So these, this is very important for the Mars rover to make sure it doesn't collide with obstacles because it's a very expensive rover. It's, it costs multiple billion dollars and we don't want any object like this to damage and end the mission for us. While we can, uh, while that's an example of how we do quantitative or the initially in, I had given example of physics, uh, computer vision as a measurement. As we start to go further, we also not just want to do measurement, but we also want to have qualitative or situational awareness for the Mars rover. On the left, what you see is an example of one of the biggest hazards the Mars rovers typically face. And um, what it is, is basically getting stuck in sand. Often that we've already had Mars rovers which have been stuck in sand and their mission have been ended. And this is one of the biggest dangers. And what the scientists and what the rover engineers want to do is develop a system that allows these rovers to think that it's what kind of surfaces it's moving on. And this is one of the technologies uh, I had worked on at JPL over the last couple of years, where we've been developing a system for terrain classification, where the Mars rover, while it's moving on the surface, not just it can think for where, a rock is or where a boulder is so that it can avoid it, it can also figure out what kind of terrain it's moving on. So on the picture on the right, you see an example of that, example of that where you see different color codings on the surface. And these color codings should present different terrain predictions. And this system is using computer vision and it's actually learn, doing that through the use of machine learning and its experience on driving on different surfaces. So the way we train these systems is, to past experience of when we have driven the marsh over on sand versus we've driven it on a piece of rock, we know how those feel like or how they look like. And based on that data and our experience, we've trained these marsh rovers to predict that what it's seeing in front of it, is it a sand or is it a rock? And it uses that to navigate itself and make sure it doesn't get stuck in sand. So this is an example of uh, computer vision and AI technologies that we've been currently building and we're, we're planning to deploy this on the Mars surface so that it can travel even further. We have even, uh, we extended that to uh, not just on surface images, but also on orbital images. So to allow for long distance path planning. So the similar kind of technology that allows us to do terrain classification from the, from the eyes of the rover, we applied that to orbital images of Mars that you see on the left. And based on that, what we can do is now use it like Google Maps on Mars. And we can allow it to go from point A to point B or let's say if you had to go between two different cities on in India, uh, how would you you would basically go to Google Maps and plan a, and it will plan a route for you. This is the same kind of technology that's using computer vision to plan long distance route for the Mars rovers, given where it is and where it wants to go. Uh, we've been not just using it for ground rovers. One of the most exciting projects that I think NASA has ever done is the Mars helicopter, and this is the first time an aerial vehicle will be launching off the planet from another uh, another planet body. And we've been we've been developing the Mars helicopter that will be launching with the next Mars mission, which will be uh, just a month from now, the Mars 2020 mission, and it will be landing on the surface of Mars in February yeah. of next year. Uh, so it will be taking with it uh, a small helicopter, uh, as you see in the video here. And that helicopter, because it moves at a very uh, fast speed, it cannot be it cannot be joystick like the Mars rover. It needs to be able to navigate on its own. And it, use it is using technology just like drones here on Earth. Uh, as you see in the picture and video right now, 
to navigate itself. It, use, it, it takes images and it uses computer vision to basically find itself where it is traveling and localizing itself to where it is on the surface of Mars. This allows it to navigate and all, not just navigate, but also safely land back uh, on a safe area on Mars. So as it's moving along the surface of Mars, uh, it's taking pictures. It's also figuring out what part of the surface is safe, what part of the surface is not safe, and deciding where can it safely land back on Mars. So this will be, again, another great example of some of the vision-based technologies that we've been developing that will be deployed on the surface of Mars to enable new forms of mobility. This is a picture of the actual Mars helicopter uh, just before it was uh, constructed and shipped to the Kennedy Space Center for launch. This is the full-scale model of that, uh, constructed and ready to be sent to Mars. Uh, this was, again, since I had a background in drones, I uh, have spent several years making drones here on Earth. This was very exciting for me to uh, help see one of the developments of the first ever uh, drone, if you would like to call for another planet body. This is the Mars 2020 rover, which is called the Perseverance rover, and the helicopter, which is called the Ingenuity uh, helicopter, will be part of this and will sit below its belly pan. And this is a picture from the from the clean room here at the Jet Propulsion Lab, just before it was completely constructed uh, in an almost complete rover fashion, uh, almost complete rover body here. This is uh, this is again a picture of the. This is of the spacecraft assembly facility where we typically bring together all the different components of the spacecraft once it's being built. And having been, uh, having grown as a big space nut myself, this was very exciting uh, earlier this year to see all the different things, kinds of things I work on actually come together in pieces to form these spacecrafts in together and see a rover and helicopter right in front of me that will next year be on the surface of Mars. So this was really a highlight or high point of my career earlier this year. So that was on autonomous navigation. I'll quickly also go over some of the other areas of uh, where we see com where we are actively developing computer vision technologies for space exploration. And one key area is autonomous landing. What you see here on the picture is a uh, is, is a lander from the Apollo missions back from when the humans were landing on the moon. And what you see is one of the Apollo spacecrafts, which was which is which landed on the surface of moon. But if you closely look at it, it's slightly tilted and it's tilted at 11 degrees. Uh, it's just one degree off from what was the tipping point of the maximum threshold that it can take for. One of the legs of this rover is actually on a big rock. And if it was only one degree more, it would actually fall off, and the hum and the astronaut would not be able to come back to this, come back to Earth, and it would be a catastrophic mission. The point of that is that it's very important for these spacecraft to be able to find a safe place to land, because unlike here on Earth, we don't have airports on on the surface of on other bodies to land. So this is again a place where computer vision is really good at. You uh, recently, uh, if you guys follow some of the recent developments on space exploration, you would have seen the SpaceX launch. And this is a very classic example of where some of those technologies are being used. The, the Falcon rocket uses computer vision as it's on its rockets, as it's coming back to land on the surface or on the, on the rocket, on the drone ship. And as it's moving towards the surface of the ground, it constantly takes pictures of the surface. It aligns itself to where it is to make sure that it safely lands at the center of uh, the target place. We've been working on how to extend this for the surface of Mars, where we don't really have a landing pad or a, a drone ship. So some, some of the technologies are very similar to what we use here on Earth, but a key difference is that rather than looking for a, where a particular uh, the drone ship is, we look for plain areas to where it is safe to land. So when when we send uh, the whole space, the lander to Mars, once it's entering the surface and it's going towards descending towards the surface, it constantly takes pictures of the surface, like you see here on the graphic, and uh, it reasons for itself which parts of the land are safe for it to land and which parts are not. This is again computer vision technology that have been developed over several years and it'll be used on the Mars 2020 mission for the first time uh, this year. Uh, so this is again like these are key takeaways to that how uh, AI technologies are not just uh, buzzwords that are being developed uh, in the box, but they are very uh, eagerly being introduced into everyday life and everyday uh, missions, both into space and also for a lot of Earth-based uh, Earth applications, commercial applications. 
Uh, looking forward, this is a very exciting project that I had worked on, on extending that not just for Mars, but also for some of the far out bodies. Uh, one of the moons of, moons of Saturn is Titan. It's again, one of my favorite uh, places in the solar system because it's one of the most similar places to Earth. It has sand dunes, it has lakes, it has, uh, it rains, uh, it has atmosphere, it has clouds, it rains. Everything is pretty much same in a geophysical nature to Earth. The only difference being that rather than having oxygen, it has a lot of methane or hydrocarbons. So it's basically a hydrocarbon planet rather than an oxygen-based planet. Uh, so, and what that means is, it's for scientists, it's, it's in various ways very similar to how Earth was just before life started here on Earth. So this is very interesting, again, for uh, scientists to go to Titan because they really want to go and understand what kinds of things allowed life to exist on Earth. And that's why we've been, we are building missions that can allow us to go to Titan. And because we don't know Titan as well as we know Mars, it's even harder to go and safely land there. And one of the projects I was working on was how to extend these autonomous landing technologies to go and land on different parts of Mars uh, that you see. On the top right, or what you see is an example of an orbital image of Titan. And if you see this, it's very similar to, and what you're seeing in the picture here are actually sand dunes. These sand, uh, these sand dunes are very similar to what you, if you would see, if you see a picture of the Sahara Desert or the Namibian Desert from orbit, uh, you basically have streaks of dunes and the regions between them called interdunes. Um, so it's a very dramatic comparison to how everything is very similar to Earth. So if we send a spacecraft to Titan, what we'd want is we would want to land safely between one of these dunes so that it doesn't get stuck in the sand. So we would want to land between one of these dunes. So as it's going down the surface, can it find where the dunes are? Can it able to process that image and basically land itself between one of those dunes? That's the example of the kind of technologies I've been working on. Uh, apart from land, so this is another example. Um, another area uh, called robotic manipulation. So this is an example of how we want to use robots, not just for uh, in a passive way for robot for vehicles, but also use it to do interesting things for us. Uh, this is an example of how we plan to use uh, robots for constructing big objects in space. So typically, we've had astronauts build big objects like the International Space Station, uh, space station for us. What we want in the future is to not risk humans, but rather use robots like this to construct either big, big, uh, big spacecrafts or big uh, telescopes uh, in orbit for us. And we've been, again, the way that does that is using uh, cameras and other sensors and using computer vision to be able to reason about how to attach these things together, how to move, how to move its hand and how to hold different objects. And that's what we really call it as manipulation. Uh, I have been also working on a project to use this for uh, rover arm operations. So basically, once we have the Mars rover, we don't just want it to be going from point A to point B. What we also want it to do is, with its arm, use it to uh, collect samples or also pick up, uh, pick up different objects on the surface of Mars. One of the most exciting missions that's upcoming in the next decade is the Mars Sample Return mission, and that's what the graphic here you see is. Uh, one of the major goals of that mission of the next rover, which is going next year, of this year, sorry, 2020, would be to collect samples of Mars. It would uh, it would land on the surface of Mars, collect interesting science samples, put them into these sample tubes, and drop them on the surface of Mars. A rover would then go back several years later uh, in the late 20s and collect those samples and bring it back to the surface of Earth. And this is a visualization of how it would look like when the surf, when the rover goes there and it looks at these samples, and it will be tasked to actually pick up these rovers, uh, pick up these samples on its own. This is a very nice uh, cartoon graphic of how that whole mission architecture looks like, where uh, as I just described, uh, and all of this needs to, a key thing is that all of these needs to be autonomous uh, because we don't uh, because of the duration of the mission and how fast. We need a lot of these activities to happen. We cannot have humans control each of these things. And we have been developing an architecture using AI technologies to enable a lot of different parts of this mission to work on its own. Uh, this is one of the biggest goals of NASA for the, uh, for the 2020s, for the Mars, uh, and it's called Mars Sample Return. And the reason this is important for, uh, for science and humanity is because over the last few decades, the way we've been doing science from Mars is we've been, we've been building great instruments. 
we've been putting them on a Mars rover and we've been sending it to Mars. But because we are so limited by space, we only are able to send five to 10 instruments at each time. What if we could bring a piece of Mars back to Earth? Now that really opens up a, the whole planet Earth and all the scientific labs around Earth to be able to use that and conduct science experiments. So this is the highest priority science goal for NASA and a lot of the space agencies around the world to bring back pieces of Mars back to Earth. Uh, this would really allow us to understand if there was life ever on Mars. Some of the more interesting areas uh, that we've been using computer vision, uh, uh, that we've been exploring how to use computer vision is not just for uh, autonomy of robots, but also of how to enable uh, scientists here in Earth to actually teleport themselves, if you would like to say, to Mars. So using concepts like virtual reality, which uses computer vision, uh, we, we, we've, been testing, we've been testing methods that would allow scientists to feel as if they are on Earth and uh, as if they are on Mars and conduct scientific experiments, observe what they are looking at and be able to conduct science rather than just looking at images. So it's much more of an immersive feel experience. And this is also something we, we can use not just for science, but also for a lot of tourism or education purposes where we can allow everyday people, uh, citi uh, every, uh, common citizens to experience feeling uh, being on the surface of Mars through telepresence of the rovers. So we've been using, again, this is all using computer vision at its back end. Uh, so that was all for a lot for space exploration and Mars exploration, but uh, we also build robots, not just for Mars uh, and other planets, but also for extreme environments. And this is really with dual purpose that a lot of the environments that on Mars are, are very extreme in nature. And what we want to do next is not just go to plain areas on the moon or Mars, but also areas which are very difficult for rovers or helicopters to go to. For example, uh, in the middle picture, what you see is a robot that we've been building for uh, rock climbing. So basically the most interesting places on other planets or where science is, is, is the actual surfaces of cliffs or mountains. If you think of here on Earth, where do you go if you want to understand the geology of Earth? It's places like the Grand Canyon, where at a snapshot, you can basically see the whole surface uh, or the whole history of how the Earth evolved. And that's the kind of places which are very interesting for scientists. And we've been developing robots that can have not just, uh, rovers cannot really go here. So we've been developing robots with computer vision and other mobility platforms to go on the surface of on the surface of these objects, climb rocks, and be able to sign, do experiments there. Uh, similar kinds of things we've been developing for other extreme environments like deep sea operations, like you see on the picture on the left, where we want to develop robots to go for search and rescue missions or also for other uh, activities like helping with oil and gas industries and maintenance uh, operations with these things where it's very dangerous for divers to operate at uh, depths like that. So we would want, we are trying to build robots that can operate on its own in places like that, uh, on it, uh, places like that and help humans not, uh, and help humans not being in danger. So we've been developing again, a lot of the things that I described that's being used in AI, uh, I'll, we've been help, we've been advancing that uh, and seeing how can those be applied to these kinds of difficult problems uh, in very unique environmental conditions. On the right is just another example of how we've been developing these robots to work on icy environments where we put uh, these uh, unique wheels with threads that can allow it to operate on ice. Uh, another example, we also had a version of this where we put skis on the, uh, skis on this robot and made these robots ski uh, on different areas of the Arctic and Greenland. And the idea there was that these kinds of robots would someday allow us to uh, either help with search and rescue for Arctic missions or help with uh, working and operating in other icy planets like Europa. We also bring a lot of the NASA work that we do, not just for space mission, but we also bring it back for here on Earth. Uh, a majority of the work we do is also for uh, a good proportion, sorry, of the work I do, of the work we do is also for national security, disaster management, and helping with the U.S. government, uh, different government agencies. And we've been developing similar computer vision and AI technologies that help us develop 
uh, robots like the, like the ones you see in the picture that can uh, work with army, that can work with air force, that can work in different kinds of search and rescue operations, that can work underground in mining situations or for, for any kinds of problems where you would not want to send or risk a human life. It helps to either support soldiers and other humans or uh, completely operate or go as a scout before we would risk human lives. So we've been de uh, developing computer vision technologies for these two. And finally, looking forward, um, what I am most excited about uh, and why I started uh, working at NASA was really this interest of how to enable human exploration. And we are, I think, living in a very exciting time where we are, li we are uh, looking at, again, really exponentially growing the human presence in space, especially with commercial companies and a lot of parallel growth happening in the industry along with just NASA. So I really look forward to how we can use these AI technologies, computer vision, machine learning, and even other fields of robotics to enable uh, the future of human exploration. And this is, this is really a wide open area um, that's just getting started. And I believe there's a lot of potential and opportunity for growth uh, here and very interesting problems to be solved here. Um, along with that, this is my final slide. And this is just to show that uh, it's not just space exploration. A lot of uh, computer vision and machine learning is basically uh, disrupting almost every industry out there. Uh, and especially some of these emerging technologies from flying cars to self-driving cars, um, and all the other even regular things like medicine, things like manufacturing, pretty much you name it. And that industry is being using computer vision and machine learning and will be using it more and more as we see forward. So with that, I would like to end my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Sorry for some of the disruptions to technology. I'm happy to take questions and um, yeah, thank you. And uh, also th this, this is my email ID here. Uh, if I cannot get to your question, or if you guys want to just follow up at some point, please feel free to reach me at this email ID. Thank you. I'll take questions now. Hi, Shreyansh. My name is Gayatri. Hi, Gayatri. Hi. Uh, so I just wanted to ask the on the slide where you were talking about Mars rover. And you said uh, NASA faced many problems when the rover was stuck in the sand on the planet's surface. And then they came up with a solution of detecting the surface it's running on. So may I know what are the uh, drawbacks of that solution of the problem? Um, sorry, can you repeat your last part? Like uh, what are the drop, which part of the solution? You mean, uh, why are we doing Machine uh, learning? No, no, no. Uh, what are the drawbacks? Like uh, every everything has a drawback of its own. So is right. there any limitation for the detecting of surface by the rover? Is there any other problem yes. that you uh, like NASA is facing? Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's that's just one example. Uh, uh, in most of my slides, I, I give you just very uh, highlights of what could be possible ways. It's, it's in no way comprehensive. It only touches the surface of what are some of the problems we face. Uh, on Mars. And so getting stuck in sand, it's, it's just one of the problems that, uh, and it's one of the bigger problems that we typically face on Mars. And even with the solution that we have proposed, uh, there are a lot of drawbacks. It's, it's just a starting point that we have started to explore now. But one of the problems with machine learning or using machine learning technologies is uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to know or hard to test them are even more hard to know if they are doing a right thing. Machine learning right now can fail very dramatically. So that, that's a major problem in how, how can you really guarantee if the kind of prediction it's making is right. So for example, what if it sees a surface and it thinks it's a rock and it basically tells the rover to drive on it, but it's actually sand and it gets stuck in it. So how do you deal with these false positives? That's one of the drawback of it. But that's also a bigger problem in general that how do you really define sand? Um, it's not just for the rovers, even for humans, it's a problem. We've had cases where the humans themselves by looking at the images were not able to figure out that this is a piece, this is sand because there was a very thin layer of dust on the surface that made it look like a uh, rock covered in sand. So even for humans, it's very hard. So it's, uh, figuring out new ways, maybe there could be new sensors, maybe there could be new ways to uh, 
probe the surface, there, there's a lot of scope in solving these. And this is just a, a one step that we have started to take right now. I hope I answered that question for you. Hello. Hello. Hi, Alan. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yes. Uh, so it's nice to talk to you, Shreyan, finally. And I had a query regarding the uh, compute requirements on board. So when we do machine learning or AI or any sort of uh, algorithm as such, it's very compute heavy. Right. So is, is it a commercial grade uh, sort of uh, hardware that you would use on board the rover to do stuff like this? Or is it something that's going to be very custom? Uh, great question. So that's actually something we, that's one of the biggest challenges we face. Uh, and especially like being on the, as an AI algorithm designer, I mean, it's both frustrating for me to be limited by computation. And it's also an interesting technical challenge to uh, solve problems for that, just to start with that. Uh, but it's, it's definitely a problem. The current Mars rovers, uh, they have one thousandth of the computation that you use on your phone. So it's extremely small. And the reason for that is that it's very expensive to build radiation hardened compute. And this is, I'm, I'm describing this for the general knowledge of everyone that uh, because we don't have GPUs, we don't have a commercial market for radiation hardened GPUs. It's really hard to build uh, GPUs for space that are cheap. So that's, that's really a limiting factor from the electronics or avionics side. Now, uh, how we try to solve this is, uh, one, there are, the, on the algorithm side, there are a lot of ways to make your algorithm efficient. So basically we look into how do you, how do you really scale down? One of the ways that we're looking is how, how do you develop more smaller neural networks that are more efficient, that are power efficient, that are compute efficient, looking at those technologies, at the same time, we are looking at other things like, so the current, the next Mars rover, which is going next year, it has a FPGA on board. So it's going to have FPGA on itself, which is, uh, so how do you develop, how do you uh, use traditional machine learning and transform them to FPGA programming? It turns out that uh, the mathematical blocks that you need for uh, machine learning, like convolution for deep learning is, it's it's, uh, it's theoretically possible to implement them. And also there are now commercially so commercial solutions that are coming up that can be implemented on FPGAs. So uh, we envision that very soon we will be able to deploy deep networks even on machine, uh, even on uh, Mars rovers. And that's one of the projects that I'm really working on and I'm pushing to hope to have uh, the deployment of the first deep learning algorithms in space. And I hope to be part of that. Uh, as of now, we don't have deep networks deployed in space. We use traditional machine learning. And it's also, that's an interesting problem where how can you train big deep networks and then use classical machine learning to deploy them? Uh, so there's a lot of very interesting ways. And the last point I'd like to say is we're also working with other commercial uh, partners, like for example, Qualcomm. Uh, and uh, to give example, where but uh, we are with the Mars helicopter that's actually going uses the Qualcomm um, processor, which is the same on your phones. And that it turns out that it has the radiation capacity to survive on the surface of Mars. And it also has GPUs and signal processors that allow you to actually run deep networks on it. So that is something we've just learned. We've started to test it. And it might be possible that we don't have to develop custom hardware and we can just use a lot of the parallel development in the commercial industry for mass applications too. Yes, uh, so my name is Chetan and I have a question on the similar line. So that the question, the previous question was on hardware, but I'd like to ask more on the software line. So do you use some open source framework and let's say tools in like, uh, let's say I'd say TensorFlow or something, or do you uh, make your own software and proprietary software at NASA? Great, um, thanks for the question. So yes, yeah, so it depends. So I am more on the research side since my role is really on the research and development. Uh, I What my role, if I have to describe is, I try to bridge the gap between where the universities work. So basically you would see new papers, very new technologies come out that have really, uh, you've just seen published papers on it. Uh, so they, the published papers are usually on prototypes or very small data set, they, they focus it. Their goal is to get an idea, do some prototype and really have a first uh, 
maybe some proof of the theory that it is viable. What this big gap then is before it can be actually used and be used for mass production, you have this big gap between what that paper says and what it is robust enough to be used in the field. That's really the big research and development phase where typically uh, university government labs work, where places like Google X, Microsoft Research, Facebook AI Research. So that's really this field of university or industry research lab is to take very early scale ideas and mature it to technologies. And then is the mass production or the flight mission phase. On the research phase, typically what you do is you don't care about highly efficient, highly production ready code. So I don't work on those things. I usually work more on quick prototype. So I use a lot of Python, TensorFlow, PyTorch, basically anything that allows me to use open source, quick prototyping, quick turnaround that allows me to use a lot of the resources that's out there for the research and papers, uh, help them transport. So most of those codes usually do not trans, uh, when you start using it for your application, they're not gonna scale. They're not gonna work the way you want them to. They have been custom designed for their thing. Uh, so it takes almost years at, or maybe even more at times to make them work robustly in your environment. And that's the part of applied research that I typically work in. And I still stick to all but still those classical frameworks. Then we do have specific programming so that goes on the Mars rover. So for example, we have our own programming languages uh, that have been open sourced also, but they are very custom designed for the way we write flight software. And then what, what happens is, uh, there are engineers, flight software engineers, who are much better at writing that piece of code, who take the work I do, use that research code and write and make it a very production or mission ready uh, implementation. So that's generally the flow of how it works. Good, thanks for that. Any more questions? Yeah, I have just collected a couple of questions uh, given by the participants. I'll just okay. uh, reading it out uh, so that you can just answer them. Great, go ahead. Yeah, uh, like regarding the maps thing you have just told, they asked, can we use heat maps for that? Uh, sorry, Shreya, can you repeat the question? I did not hear you well. Yeah, uh, they just wrote that, can we use heat maps? Uh, heat maps for what? Uh, for what in which slide uh, they have asked, uh, they didn't uh, mention it clearly, sir. They just uh, wrote that. Uh, can we use heat maps? I guess regarding the map session you have just taken in the middle, like how the rovers will be and everything. How the okay, uh, I'll try to answer that question based on what I interpreted. Uh, and whoever asked that can feel free to please follow up on it. Uh, so if you mean uh, by heat map is like a thermal image, or for example, looking at a thermal uh, properties of the surface. Yes, that's a very good idea. And we have been exploring that. We've been looking at how uh, at properties like thermal inertia, the emissivity of the surface, the radiation from the surface. And uh, that is a very good way to figure out what the surface material is. So for example, that's, that's one way to separate what sand is and what rock is. Uh, if you look at the property, if you even on earth, like if you go out and see how the how a rocky surface versus a sandy surface cools and heats up, it's very different. And we know how those physical properties change. So just by studying and understanding or observing those properties, we can differentiate between different surfaces. So yes, that's a, that's a very good idea. And we are right now exploring that as well. Yes, sir, they just wrote, sir, uh, like uh, they meant, uh, we ca can we use heat maps for locating terrain? terrain? Yes, so that's that's exactly what I answered. Uh, yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. And another question, sir. How rover yeah. how rover in the mass locate the position while moving it by moving? Is it using GPS? Uh, no. So, a uh, uh, great question again, and uh, I should have probably covered that. That's actually the first algorithm for computer vision that was ever used on another planet. And it was one of the first, so it's an algorithm called visual odometry. So one of the first things, if you'd ever take a computer vision class, uh, would typically you would be introduced as, uh, is visual odometry. And it refers to uh, an algorithm where how human, uh, how a robot would typically localize itself as to where it's moving. So how that works is in a very simple nutshell is as the rover takes image, as the rover moves, it takes images 
And what it does is it compares the image it has taken right now to the image previously taken. And it creates a six dimensional transform at, uh, between those images. And that tells us how far it has moved. So that's, that's in a very simple uh, nutshell, the algorithm it uses. You would hear uh, other, you would typically, when you read about it, you'll hear algorithms like SLAM uh, or visual odometry, visual navigation. And that's the same kind of thing that the Mars helicopter would be using to navigate itself. And the Mars rover already uses that um, to localize uh, itself on the surface of Mars as it's moving. Thank you, sir. Another question. Is there any possibility of quicksand on Titan? That's a great question. Uh, I would say yes. Um, I haven't read anything about it, but uh, I don't see uh, it, it's it, it's very eerie how similar Titan is compared to Earth. And that's why my it, it's actually very given that I studied Titan for two years, I got very excited about how it is, and given that there is a lot of... So one of the key differences between Titan and any other places in the solar system is that uh, the geophysical cycle is very active. So the sand dunes actually move, just like here on Earth. It rains. So there is a proper atmospheric cycle. It rains, it again evaporates, it then comes back down. Um, you have movement of sand. So it's, exact, it's a very active planet, uh, just like Earth. So... Uh, I don't know enough about the physics of or the physiological reasons of why quicksand happens, but I would envision just assuming uh, it it follows the similar properties to everything else. I would assume it does. It it would I, we would imagine we would expect that. Thank you, sir. There's another question. Uh, using yeah. artificial intelligence to explore and navigate to Europa, is it using both CNN and RNN algorithms to work together? Um, you could, I mean, so the CNN and RNN, it really depends on what is your goal and what you're trying to use. Uh, we have, we explore RNN typically in the concept of like, if we need to do things like neural or uh, natural language processing uh, or memory units. So we have been looking at ways into how, uh, one of the AI technologies that I did not talk about, we have been looking at is how can we describe uh, what images it's seeing. So the communication is a very big uh, limitation for uh, for spacecrafts. So especially like as the number of spacecraft grows, we can only send very small amounts of data back to Earth because it's very limited. So bandwidth is a huge problem. So one AI technology we've been looking at is rather than sending images back to Earth, which is very expensive, can you use AI to convert images to small text information. So now you're going from uh, gigabytes of information to kilobytes of information, and you can just send those kilobytes of information easily back to Earth. So that's why we've been using RNN a bit, but it really depends on the problem uh, and the model that you'll be using, uh, and not so much about whether it's Europa or something else. Thank you, sir. Another question. If by mm -hmm. any chance the helicopter loses its connectivity with your controls, what are the other options you have to get connectivity back? Okay, um, so uh, I'll answer that question in two part. If the question is related to how we are controlling it, we are not controlling it. So the connectivity is not dependent on, so, so for me, uh, is not dependent on whether the robot can be controlled or whether it will lose control in air. Uh, so, for example, when you are here, if you're joysticking a drone here on Earth, you typically have it controlled with your joystick. But there are also autonomous drones, and they would just fly on their own. So even if you lose the connectivity, it's not a problem. It's it's independent, and it has its own AI-based control that it uses. And that's exactly what's required from us. In terms of uh, if general connectivity, it still needs to talk to the Mars rover or send back information and things like this. We have uh, radios set up on the Mars rover. So basically the way we would talk to the helicopter is through the communication, through the antennas on the Mars rover. Uh, we have made it, uh, I mean, they are redundant. We've, we've tested it enough that hopefully the radios do not fail at some point, but if for some reason the radios on the helicopter fails and we could no longer talk to it, I mean, that would be a mission critical situation where we would no longer be able to talk to the Mar uh, Mars helicopter. But uh, we those are things that uh, we designed for. So we 
we spend years trying to make sure we test out every possible condition that could go wrong and uh, make a robust enough hardware for that. Hello? Uh, hello, can you guys still hear me? Yes, yes we are can. Yeah, can, is there, are there any more questions? I hope that answered the question. Uh, if there was something I missed, please let me know. Hello? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Govind. Uh, I, my question is whether the automated landing is possible in uh, when a, a craft is landing on a object which is more adverse, which has more adverse terrain, uh, like a comet or a asteroid. Great question. Uh, thanks, Ovid. Uh, so, I mean, in principle, it's possible, but it's definitely hard. A lot of the things are hard. We have uh, we have exact we have projects right now ongoing to look at that. Uh, it's a very challenging problem because both the surface is uh, unknown uh, for a lot of parts. It's uh, much more dynamic. It's a, it's a much more, uh, uh, the surface is not as flat as the, you would find on Mars typically. So it's a much more sharp surface. So finding regions, uh, mapping those regions, it's hard. The surface of some of those asteroids are also textureless. So even getting good features to create a map is hard sometimes. But I think the biggest challenge also is also from the physics and the mechanical side where, because usually those asteroids don't have gravity, uh, one of the biggest challenges is how to, even if you land, how do you stay stuck on the surface? So uh, we have projects we've been looking at, how do you develop grippers? So as soon as you land, you basically hold on to the surface on that. So there's a lot of interesting mechanical as well as computer vision problems to be solved there. And we have active projects that have been look that are looking into it. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Apart from heat maps, what are other forms of sensing uh, which makes up computer vision in Mars? In Mars. Well, so computer vision generally refers to um, sensing from any kind of visual data traditionally, uh, but it's a pretty broad term uh, in general. So if you're uh, typically using other sen like touch sensors, that's usually not com considered computer vision. So one of the ways to look for terrain we've been looking at is if you could provide some mechanical sensors uh, that provide on the wheel of the rover. And if you could basically touch the surface and feel, uh, so it's almost like poking. So if, imagine if you're putting a leg on a surface to test whether uh, what what it is before actually committing yourself to work on it. That's the kind of technologies that uses some for other form of sensing. One more form of sensing, which I feel is an extension to computer vision is uh, things like hyperspectral. So when we typically talk about computer vision, we talk about the visible spectrum of the image, visible spectrum, so RGB images, color images, but uh, we do have hyperspectral cameras and hyperspectral uh, instruments on Ma on the Mars rover. So we can technically see the surface of Mars in other spectral bands. And those spectral bands are much better to actually look at different properties of the terrain. So how do we uh, transform computer vision algorithms to work with that kind of data? Uh, we've been looking at that too. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's a question, another question. Uh, what is your view about Chandrayaan 2? Have they found it? Uh, can you repeat the second part of the question? Chandrayaan 2 and what? Uh, can you repeat the question, Shreya? I think she lost the connectivity. Hello, sir. I think she lost the oh, connectivity. Okay. Uh, I, 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 okay. Sir, I, I have a question. I, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so I have a question while talking about computer visions and the career prospects leading towards NASA. So I just wanted to know if uh, like any graduate who has been graduated from information systems, can he be a part of the computer vision team or the R&D team at NASA? Uh, 
Well, so the degree doesn't, I mean, it's a subjective answer. So, I mean, of course, like your degree is not always limiting. So we have very diverse backgrounds from where we get people. Uh, for example, right now I have a intern with me. Uh, I have other colleagues who are from very diverse backgrounds. So for example, my intern, he is a medical student who is helping with computer vision and machine learning because he wanted to, he got some experience with that and he wanted to learn more about it. So uh, it depends on what your back, what skills you have. If you've never worked on computer vision, uh, that would be hard to do that. But if you, uh, it doesn't matter necessarily what your degree is specific, but if you have a background in computer vision, if you have background in the kinds of technologies you want to work in, that's what we'll really look for. If you have the skill set to work on it, uh, uh, if you have the expertise to I'll work on I'll just rephrase it. my, yeah. So I'll just rephrase my question. Uh, as a uh, information systems graduate, what are the options I have in uh, NASA? Um, Again, that's that's beyond my field usually, uh, but uh, there are a lot of, I mean, so NASA is pretty huge. I mean, there's pretty much in, you can name a, a career option and NASA hires for that. So I am sure there are areas of NASA where information systems is used. It may not be as much on, uh, it may be more on the business team side of things or uh, the IT side of things we have been, to be able to do all of this, we need huge IT infrastructures, uh, both in the context of space, but more importantly, in the context of data here on earth, in the context of how everything works together. So that's where I would envision, like for example, when we have uh, data coming from all the earth satellites, how does that data get processed? How does that uh, data allow is used for real-time updates for uh, weather reporting? How does that data used by different industries like agriculture, all of that needs to be done and you need to have the information systems infrastructure for that. So uh, I don't have exactly an exact answer for you, but uh, I'm sure that there are a lot of places where information systems graduate can find place. So basically it is on the analytical side. Yes, that's what I would say. I mean, again, it's for a lot of things, it's, it's up to you to form a niche and you can pretty much bring to the table something like few before i started there was no uh, there was no place of machine learning for space exploration so there was people were not being hired for using machine learning or computer vision machine learning specifically so when i started uh, i gradually got that into the table so there are things which may not currently exist which if you are an expert at you can probably bring into the table and help nasa understand how, why you need that so that's also one way to go about it or the other ways to look at what places it could be useful and uh, align your background to that. Hope that helps. Yes, yes, thank you. Hello, sir. Uh, yes. I would like to repeat the previous question, which I was telling. And I like, unfortunately, I just left the meeting. So mm -hmm. the question was that, uh, like, did you get any information about the Chandrayaan 2? which was lost, uh, did you get any information they were asking? What are okay. your views I mean, about it? Uh, I'm not sure in what context are you asking about the views of Chandrayaan 2. I mean, it was obviously a great mission. Uh, I was, I mean, everybody at JPL and NASA was cheering for it. We all basically, when it was about to land, we all left our, we were all staring at our screens, hoping and wishing for it. It's a very healthy, uh, space is a very healthy environment. I mean, even though it doesn't seem like, but uh, NASA, ISRO, we are great collaborators. We work together on, we have a mission that we are working together on. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of uh, to and fro. We, we, all, we always have NASA people at ISRO and vice versa. So we were rooting for it. Uh, what, what happened was unfortunate, but we also understand that it's one of the hardest parts of the mission. Uh, I think JPL has, expertise in that and that's why we understand how hard it is to land things on another planet uh, i was in a room of uh, recently where it was basically like we realized that everybody who's ever landed a spacecraft on mars is in that room uh, and that's that's both a good feeling to be but it's also it makes you realize that this is such a hard problem and it takes uh, decades to master it and so it's, I don't think it's anything negative on that, that they, it did not work at first. It, I don't, uh, nobody really solves it in first 
step if you could that's great that's fantastic and uh, we were uh, isro was very close to doing this and everybody was cheering for that uh, so yeah i mean i think we hopefully we'll be going back very soon and we'll be making it successful thank you so much sir and uh, uh, like uh, the people have just uh, like i just finished the questions which they have sent i request to the delegates if you have any queries you can just uh, Keep it in the chat box, and uh, can you just take most questions or raise it to people? Great. And again, I would reinstate that if anybody wants to reach out for either questions related to my presentation or anything related to career uh, in these fields in general, uh, feel free to email me. Yes, yeah, sir. The, there's one question which was asked by two persons. I'll just uh, wind up with this last one, sir. Okay. Yeah. Are the instrumentation engineering working there? Like uh, instrumentation engineering ones, the people are working there. What we need to have to join NASA as an instrumentation engineering graduate. Great. Um. Yeah. There is. I mean, a lot of what we do is instrumentation. I mean, we literally build instruments. All the whole Mars rover can th be thought of as an instrument for space for Mars. So that's probably one of the most core skills to have as an instrumentation engineer. Um, so pretty much getting expertise in what you're doing and looking at in, if you have interesting problem, if you have worked on uh, problem projects related to uh, space exploration, thinking of instruments first place, uh, some of the ways to get started as a university student is looking at uh, student projects. If you have the resource to be on one for CubeSats or even uh, other challenges, even if you are not part of an actual team that's working on those things. If there are a lot of NASA challenges out there uh, that look at these kinds of problems. So getting your hands dirty, understanding what are the core, uh, what are the specific challenges that come for instrument engineering from the space context and trying to learn more about it, get your hands, uh, get your experience on that. That will really help you get a head start on, uh, on your entry to a uh, career in space and uh, space and probably at NASA. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, and uh, sorry for the disturbances which happened in the between the session. And it was really an amazing uh, session, sir. We have just got lots of information and what NASA is doing and what's your part and everything. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it was a great session. Thank you so much, Shreya. Thank you so much, uh, Alta, for inviting me and the whole uh, chapter for holding this. All the audience, uh, this this was a great list of questions. I had a great time answering and interacting with you guys. And again, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I had a great time. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any follow-up. Yeah. Thank, thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation. Great. Uh, and uh, thank you guys again, and uh, hope all of you guys stay safe and please stay healthy in these difficult times. Cheers. Yeah, yeah. thank you, sir. Good night. Yeah, good night. thank Bye. you, sir. Have a good day, sir. You too. Yeah. Thank you, sir.